Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Toot Suite. And uh, I'm Adam Lee with Siduri Winery, and I'm here with my good friend, Mike Officer from Carlisle Winery. Uh, we're going to talk today with Mike about his wines and how he makes wine, and who knows wherever the conversation <laughs> will lead us. We're, we're going to go there. So welcome, and, and we hope you can take part and join in with us today. Mike, how's it going? Hmm? Uh, good, good. A little nervous about you interviewing me, given everything you know about me, you, but, uh, you know. Your wife calls me your second wife, right? That, that is true. I mean, you are the only one I can call at five in the morning and not not wake up. The, the difficult thing, though, is that Mike knows as much about me as I know about him, so, yeah, we, so we can't go too far so, there. So, so play nice. I will. I will play nice. <laughs> Um, so, Mike, I mean, I've obviously known you for a long time. There's no real way that I know of that people come, normal way that people come by winemaking. I mean, it's not like, there are some people that are born into it here or there, but there's many people that I know of, like you, that came about it, not through what I would think would be a, a regular path. It wasn't something that, you had an interest in wine for a long time, a love of wine, but it wasn't a thing you planned on. You didn't study for it or anything like that, correct? Um, so I had an older sister who was a restaurateur in San Francisco, and one night she was having a dinner party and asked if I wanted wine, and I actually said, why would anyone drink wine when there's Welch's grape juice? And uh, she said, have you had a good wine? And I said, I don't know, aren't they all the same? And so she poured something for me, and it was like ambrosia. It just, you know, literally opened up a whole new world to me, and by the end of the evening, I was drinking Cabernet Sauvignon, and in college, I was probably the only kid in, in school that had a wine cellar in his dorm room, so uh, I, I was hooked. And you told me you were like on some of the mailing lists, some of the cult cab, what are now cult cabs, or maybe at the time early on, maybe even before you were supposed to be. Even before I was 21, to be honest, I was on a few cult uh, right. Cabernet producers list. So when you ended up getting into making wine, and I mean, you made wine at your house for a while, I, I, I know that, but did you make cab? Was that something you first wanted to do? A lot of us start with cab, or that's someplace you begin. Yeah, you know, I, I didn't start with cab. Uh, for some reason, I, I felt a very strong affinity for Zinfandel, and specifically for Old Vine Zinfandel. Um, you know, I'm, I'm the kind of person, I like antiques, I like tradition, I like history. Um, and so there was a great appeal uh, to Old Vine Zinfandel. So um, that was kind of my focus. I mean, as a home winemaker, I did make Cabernet. Hell, I even made Pinot Noir. I, I remember yeah, that. Yeah. It was pretty good, uh, I thought. No, it was not, not like yours. Right. Um, but uh, but b basically, I was a Zinfandel producer as a home winemaker. And it, you made it in your garage as a home winemaker? Did you do... I know they're like home winemaking groups. Zap has always done a, a big job of promoting home winemaking groups and all of that. Um, yeah. In fact, uh, for many years, there was a special section of Zap members for the home winemakers. Yeah. Uh, it was a special club that I think met quarterly. And uh, I, I was a member of that, and at the Zap events uh, at Fort Mason every year, there was a home winemaker's table, and I got to pour our wine at that. And, and you know, I, I think that did a lot to encourage me to go commercial because, you know, there was a very favorable response to what I was doing just out of my garage. And, you know, that was without, you know, full-on temperature control and all the, the tools of the trade, and, you know, it was pretty rudimentary, but, but we did well with so it. So going commercial, though, I mean, that's obviously a big step, but that didn't mean you gave up your day job right off the bat, either. No, 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 no. In fact, uh, yeah, it was kind of funny. So uh, when we went commercial, thanks to you, you uh, we made our first two vintages at Siduri in 1998 and 1999. Um, so thanks to Adam for that. But um, when we uh, uh, went commercial, um, we uh, – what was the question again? <laughs> uh, health, I know. Um, no, I, uh, I, basically, you didn't give up your day job, right? No, now, no, right, oh, right, was, right, yeah. right, exactly. So, so when we went commercial in 1998, um, I still had my day job in San Francisco, and I was commuting about four and a half to five hours a day by bus from Santa Rosa to San Francisco. And uh, it, it was, I was using my vacation for doing all the winemaking. It was, it was hell because I'd have a change of clothes in my truck at the, uh, at the park and ride lot. And as soon as I got off the bus, I'd run over to your place, change into shorts and a grubby t-shirt, do my punch downs, pump overs, whatever, get home around midnight, and then have to get up at 4 a.m. to go back to San Francisco and work all day. Um, so harvest was really, really tough. And, but 
we needed my job to provide the money to get the business going. And, uh, but in 2000, I kind of found that we were in this catch 22 where um, I had made a thousand cases on my own that year. And that was about as much as I could handle uh, having this full time job in San Francisco. But it was never going to be enough wine that I could give up my job in San right. Francisco. So the key was to um, hire a good friend of mine, Jay Maddox, who is now our winemaker. Uh, he was a good friend of mine in undergraduate at Pomona College. And with him on board, we were able to take it to 2,500 cases. And next year, we caught our breath in 2002, kept at 2,500, then went to 3,500, stayed at 3,500 in 2004. And that's finally when Kendall came to me and said, hey, good news, honey, you can quit your day job. So the day I get, went in to work to give notice, uh, Inc. Magazine had done an article about how I'd use my salary as seed capital to get this uh, winery going. And as I was waiting for my manager to come in, so I could give notice. I ran down to Fog City News on Market Street. There was the new issue. I bought it, ran outside, found the article. They entitled it, Don't Quit Your Day Job. <laughs> so, of course, I freaked out, thought it was an omen. I wasn't supposed to quit. I called Kendall. She assured me everything was going to be okay. And uh, I went in, gave notice, and it's been great. Now, I know uh, also Kindle does a lot of stuff. It probably gets less of the, the press. I mean, in the, she's not on too sweet. She's not here. Yeah, that kind of thing. But yeah, no, she I does know. a lot of the stuff. I yeah. know. You know what? She does everything so I can do one thing, basically. Yeah. Uh, she is a saint, and I love her dearly. She handles all matters financial. Well, except for the spending of the money, I do that. Um, but uh, no, she she really, really has been a huge supporter. And w without her, this wouldn't have happened. And in fact, the, the Carlisle name. Yeah, the Carlisle name. It's her maiden name, you know. When we were trying to come up with a, a name for the winery, uh, you know, we were scratching our heads. And, and uh, we were calling the home wines Carlisle because, you know, officer doesn't really work well right. on a wine label. And um, and finally, someone said, you know, everyone knows your homemade wines is Carlisle. Why not stick with that? And uh, we did. And uh, plus, I needed to score points with my father-in-law. Of course. Which, uh, it's I a did. gorgeous package, too. I mean, I've always thought that about the, the wines, about the labels and all of that. I mean, I know you spend a lot of time. It's things people don't talk about a lot, but it's it's very classy in a lot of ways. No, it's, it's, yeah, thank you. And, yeah. you. and you know what? It seems like so many labels change yeah, every couple of years. Yeah. And our label basically has never changed. Right. Um, we've kept with it because, and and that's what we were after was something kind of timeless, you know, something that that could go for forever. But it's a lot of work. I mean, to come up with a package, and it, people don't always realize if you changed one thing, you change oh. everything. I oh mean, yeah, yeah. You change yeah. the bottle, then well, you yeah, have to change and, and the cork. Of course, and, when you're using a mobile bottling line, you yeah. know, it's it's once you get the package working. You're definitely afraid to change it, right? Because mm -hmm. you know something may go wrong. Sure. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, we have some questions from the live audience. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Hey. Um, so this is for, this is the question is um, ask if you have any new vineyards, varietals, and or types of wine that you'll be adding into the Carla. Yeah, I was going to ask kind of an overview of what you got, plus that as well. Oh, all right. Well, so uh, as an overview, I mean, we make a lot of different wines, small lots, um, mostly old vines and fendels, um, and then Rhone varieties. And recently, uh, beginning in 2010, we've added whites um, so, and, and from old vines. Well, two, three whites, two are from old vines. One is Gruner Veltliner, the only one made in Sonoma County. Um, but in terms of new stuff, oh, geez, let me think about this. Um, you know, we, we just did a contract to plant for a new Syrah and Morvedra vineyard in Bennett Valley, way up at high altitude. Mm -hmm. The vineyard looks like, I mean, the vines look like they're growing in pure rock. It's, it's an incredible sight. Um, but otherwise, let's see, uh, we're working with Pete Sagacio's San Lorenzo vineyard this year. Um, and what else is new? Uh, I think that's probably it. Um, there, there, there are a few new things uh, in 2013, like the uh, Demostini Vineyard in Alexander Valley, planted in the 1890s, that will uh, be coming out with next year. Um, 
But, uh, yeah, I think at the moment that's all that comes to mind. So tell me about, like, whites, because, uh, I mean, you mentioned that, and we're drinking Oh, yes, white. yeah, yeah. We're, we're actually drinking the 2012 Derivative, which is coming out um, – this uh, November, mm -hmm. and it's a blend of 54% uh, Simeon from the Monte Rosso vineyard planted in 1886, so very, very old vines, with 30% Muscadel from the Pagani Ranch in Sonoma Valley planted in 1920, and 16% uh, Palomino from the Saitone Ranch planted in 1895. So the fact that it's a blended wine from different uh, vineyards, I mean, I know you've kind of done that before with the Sonoma County's in or something like that, but sure. it's not been the the pursuit necessarily to make a blended wine, but here it is the pursuit to make a blended wine? Is that... Um, you know, in, in this particular case, uh, I, th I think so, because it gives us more freedom. Um, you know, the, the idea of this wine, it's called the derivative because it's a derivative of a white that was made in California back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, called Hock, H-O-C-K. And it was just a dry white of the varieties that were popular in that era, which included these varieties, Simeon, Muscadel, Palomino, um, Putschir, a.k.a. Green Hungarian, things like that. So, so this is kind of a modern-day version of Hock. And, and there are not many uh, patches of old vine whites left in California. And so by just doing a blended Sonoma County derivative, we, uh, we have options. It, it is making white really different? I mean, I make a little bit of white wine, and I, I've never felt like I had a great handle on it. I'm still learning my way along. Oh, uh, for sure, and, and, and we, we are too. In fact, the first year we made whites, I, I was terrified. Um, but uh, we, we seem to be figuring it out and, and getting better with each vintage, um, at least I hope so. Um, do you make them separate, the three different things, and then blend them together, or we, do you we, work them? We do, we do, okay. um, and, and we usually do the blending the following summer, um, where we'll take all the components and come mm -hmm. up with the best blend. Do you ever foresee a day, I mean, we've played with this before, and I, I started to like it, but it took us a long time to get there, where you can, like, make the components together, not completely, but, I mean, somewhat, and then play yeah, with yeah, it? You mean earlier? Earlier, or earlier yeah, front? I mean, actually ferment together I mean, in some way. Yeah. Is it possible? I don't know, ripening uh, time. Ripening wise, I think all these vineyards are, you know, they probably span about five weeks. That'd be hard. And, and so it would be hard to do. But, but uh, you know, we may be able to speed things up and do the blend earlier uh, eventually. But, right. but we're still. You know, well, one of the things we started playing with is doing like what we basically think is the blend earlier, close enough. You learn over the years that it's right, this, this, right. and this, and then you start to add. Uh, but you keep some separate, and then you can play from yeah, there yeah, in some ways. Yeah. So. Well, and we, um, we may get well, to that point. What about um, with a white wine filtering and all of that? I mean, it's people, uh, even even though you could go unfiltered, maybe in some cases, but people don't like seeing stuff floating uh, around in their white wine. That, that's true. That's true. And and typically, most of our whites um, are uh, you know either case and find and or bentonited, um, you know, another finding agent. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of, and so if you do that, obviously you do have to filter the wine, and so we'll cross-flow it, but then uh, sometimes we won't do any filtration on the mobile bottling line. Another question. This okay. is from Frank. Hi, Frank. Hey, Frank. Um, so Hi, Frank. he said, uh, he asked about Pinot Noir, and he said, it would be fun to have a Pinot challenge with Uncle Sid there and what he's made so well for so many years at Sidori. Like a Pinot you, making it challenge, that's Frank Murray, um, our good <laughs> friend, who's asking the question. Um, Mike made, well, I know Pinot, like, I tried from the Hopkins Ranch, I believe it was, oh, yeah, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, used yeah, to be, yeah, is, yeah. is a, um, not, and, but then you made some Pinot. We, we did, thanks to you. We made a, a Rosella's Vineyard yeah. Pinot in 2005, and we did a, uh, was that Gary's in yeah. 2000? No, no, that was nope. Gary's in 2006. Six. And then in 2007, at uh, Steiner Vineyard on Sonoma Mountain, we made a couple barrels of Pinot. Um, we, it's actually codenamed the Love Juice because uh, my wife is, is a huge, huge Pinot fan, and she said, you know, one day, I want you to make Pinot. And she, just to ensure it was as good as possible, she said, and just remember, honey, the better the Pinot, the better the lovin'. So you've never seen someone sweat over a half ton of Pinot grapes as much as I did. If you start making Pinot, though, my sales will decline because you uh, buy Pinot, so consequently... <laughs> um, Hardly. We'll, we'll still buy We'll still pinot. buy some Pinot. Yeah, All right, good. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
No, I mean, things like that, though, I think are kind of fun. I remember we blended a wine together. You meet Diana um, when testosterone. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, that was we a, did, a, a Syrah blend. So we didn't yeah, do a yeah, Pinot blend. Yeah. But I think some of the things that people don't always realize is that we, it's fun as winemakers to occasionally have these playthings. It keeps you excited about oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, what absolutely. you're doing. That's my love is, is, well, I mean, I love wine, but I love yeah. vineyards. And I love grapes. And and uh, finding new sources that, you know, may potentially make a great wine. I mean, that's 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 part sure. of the game. That's what keeps me going. Ooh, um, according to that, I mean, there, uh, along that line, as you, is there really ever a business plan? I mean, I know that I haven't kind of necessarily had it, but then like when great grapes come your way or you find them or you work to find them or whatever uh, happens, uh, is there a plan for it? Uh, yeah, you know, I wish I could say we had a business plan, but but truthfully we don't. I mean, the business plan is is over deliver and under charge basically. Right. I mean, and you do keep your prices. I mean, not, not trying to kiss your ass here, but you kept your prices very. Yeah, you're yeah, right there. Yeah, um, you kept your prices very fair, and I mean, it's something we've tried to do. I mean, but I think it's something important when wine pricing has gone up an awful, awful lot out there. Uh, that's true, you know, and, and people, it's funny when your customer, I've had so many customers tell me to raise prices and you, you kind of start wondering, geez, am I doing the right thing when the customers right. are telling you to raise prices? But, um, but truthfully, I am terrified of selling wine and, you know, unlike you, who you, you are the God when it comes to sales, um, I'm not. And so, uh, I figure, you know, by, by keeping our prices low, Hopefully, the wine will disappear quickly, right. and I can go back to the vineyards and to the cellar. There's there's always that kind of worry. That, I mean, there's a lot of people that talk about European wine these days in general and how price much more affordable it is than California wine. Um, and But I look at it in some of the European regions, you see the producers aren't making it. I mean, yes, it's affordable when it here in comparison, yeah, look, but they don't yeah, make a living. Yeah, look at uh, the, the Muscadet producers in the Loire, you know, who, uh, you know, they're having to rip out their vineyards. Because they're, yeah, and, and the, I think the government bought some of the wine for turn uh, into fuel or fuel something. Or, yeah. or something, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, it's horrible. And so in a case like that, while it's good for the consumer short run, long run, I don't think it's mm. even good for the consumers either. No. So you got to find a way to make some money doing this no, for as sure. well. For sure. Um, which kind of would lead to old vines in some ways. I know the white is obviously older vines. The, the, one of the reds, I don't know, we do Carlisle or Prepara, whichever order you want to. Hmm? Yeah, let's do let's do Carlisle. Okay. Uh, old vines don't give you much in the way of yields, uh, uh, and no. so that's a hard thing to make some money off it. Uh, it's very hard, but but you know part of the, part of the reason why they don't give much in the way of yields is because. Um, uh, you know, a grower who has old vines has to make periodically an investment back into the vineyard because eventually <clears throat> some vines are going to die due to virus. Um, some are going to, you know, get what we call tractor blight when they're taken out by a tractor. And over time, the number of misses in a, a an old vine vineyard will add up, and, mm -hmm. and that will lead to a decrease in yield. So you have to make an effort to reestablish vines in those miss those missing spots. And as long as you do, you can make an old vine vineyard economically viable. So is it kind of an average of yields at some point in time that one? I mean, yeah. we can go back to when it starts. So I know in Burgundy, that's the case. It's 60-year-old vines or 40, but some of them are younger, some of them are older. Yeah, and yeah, and, and you know, the, I mean, as long as the vineyard was in relatively good shape, I would say probably 90% of the vines are going to be, you know, very, very old, and then 10% will be young. Right. And, and you could even, and we do this, we even pick out the young vines uh, uh, sometimes separately from the old vines. Do you, do you we'll, farm them separately too? I mean, do you have uh, to with water or anything? Yeah, going exactly. On? You know, like, okay, so we're drinking Carlisle Vineyard right now. Um, in this vineyard, we actually did do uh, uh, replants where there were misses. And we actually went to the great cost and, and pains of establishing or setting up a drip system in this vineyard. But there are only emitters on the replants, okay. not on the old vines. And so we were watering those to get them established. And in fact, beginning about two years ago, we started weaning them off the drip because they're now uh, 10 to 12 years old. 
Um, so, and, and, you know, pruning, we might do a little bit differently. Um, mm -hmm. They tend to break bud earlier, so they ripen earlier. And if we want them to ripen later, we need to prune them later. So, yeah, we do farm them, farm them separately. Cool. We have someone that's joined us here, is that correct? Or a few people? I see. Mm -hmm. Cheers. Uh, on the screen. Cheers. How's it going? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, we can hear you now. Just enjoying the banter. Um, question for both of you guys uh, with regards to the business aspect of things. Um, how much do you sell direct to consumer versus through wholesale channels? Uh, if you want to, if you want to actually say that, I understand that could be sensitive. Go, go. No, it, it's not sensitive. We we don't. That's not sensitive. You know as well. That's the, you can go much <laughs> much further than that. Uh, we're bigger, so we sell a lot more through wholesale channels. We're about 35% direct. And, and being much smaller, we're about 90% direct. Oh, wow. Did, Thank you very much. How did you establish the mailing list? I mean, that, that's one of those hard things, too, as far as... Um, you know, well, I mentioned Zap, pouring at the yeah. home winemaker's table. We actually were getting sign-ups because, you know, when people found out that we uh, were thinking of going commercial... Um, they said, we want to be part of this. So, you know, do you have a mailing list I can sign up for? Do you think it's different now? I mean, we were kind of talking about it on the way over. And, I mean, it's a great question that you ask because um, things like this didn't exist, what, three? I don't know. How long has Two Sweet been around? But, I mean, it's, it's for that period of time, it's changed. Three years, I think, yes, um, as we get a signal back over here. Um, it, this didn't exist as ways of, of getting consumers no, it, it didn't. It didn't. You know, it was all about trying to get a, a someone's address and, and yep. you know, and have them sign up on the mailing list. And, and things have changed greatly just in the time. Uh, I sometimes know, think we haven't changed as fast oh, as no, other no, things no, have no, changed, have, unfortunately. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, for, for me to go out and do what we've done, uh, if I was starting out today, I, I mean, knowing what I know now, I, I think I'd be too terrified to even try it. So, <laughs> you just need to drink more, and, well, and the yeah, terror yeah, goes yeah, away. Right. Cheers. Cheers, yeah. Um, so, Carlisle, this is your own? Oh, so, this is actually our own uh, vineyard. We purchased it in 1998 from Barbara Paletti. Um, her father planted it in 1927, uh, the same year she was born, in fact. And um, uh, one of the really cool things about this vineyard is I think Alcide was a bit of a grape junkie. I guess much like I am, uh, because I've done a, a lot of ampelography work in this vineyard. Ampelography is the identification of vines through their physical characteristics, and have discovered that although the vineyard is 87% Zinfandel, in that remaining 13% are 39 different varieties, including uh, a fair number of whites. And so we pick everything at the same time, and uh, just co-ferment it. And, and, I mean, there's some crazy stuff out there. There's, well, I don't know, maybe it's not so crazy, but things like Aburiu and Aubun, um, Grec Rouge. On the whites, we have Chassel Blanc. We have uh, the only vineyard I've ever seen it, Albio Mayor, which is grown in the Ribera del Duero in Spain. Um, so there's there's some pretty cool stuff. Remind me, um, prohibition in California. I mean, obviously nationwide, but planning in twenty seven in, in the middle of prohibition. Yeah, yeah. What? yeah. Who would have thought? Why? Uh, well, Alcide Paletti was from uh, a little village uh, from the hills of Tuscany, uh, just north of Lucca in San Pellegrinetto, and you know maybe maybe Alcide needed his wine. I okay. Don't know. So uh, and then. The the other wine that we're going to have here in a little bit is from a vineyard, you say, within a stone's throw. I was giving you grief about that earlier. I can't throw a stone that far. But well, it's, you got to practice. I do. I need yeah, to work yeah, that up. Yeah. Um, but it's not far away. But it's the 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 uh, the, the next wine, um, Papera, is almost all in. While this other one is is you mentioned all these that, other grape types, and it true. wasn't that far apart when they were planted. Yeah, and and all these Italians were all good friends, and so the Papera Ranch, you know, well, okay, I said stones throw, but as Whatever. the crow flies, it's probably uh, we'll call it what three quarters of a yeah, mile. Yeah, so mm -hmm. a long throw. Okay, um, but. It was only planted seven years later in 1934, and it is almost all Zinfandel. And what little mixed blacks there are, 
it's mainly carignan. Why anyone would plant carignan in such a cool environment? Because uh, this is a very cool subregion of the Russian River. I don't know. I, I often wonder. I mean, is he history major in college and all that? If there's a story here to be written about, in California we now have everything is planted, like vineyards are planted generally to one grape type, and we kind of started moving away from that, but this is a Cabernet vineyard, this is a Zin vineyard, this is... Was there something that happened? I mean, I I know you don't know the answer, I don't know the answer, but between 27 and 34, why that would change that way? Hmm? Um, I, I don't, but, but, you know, I've seen some other vineyards in the 1930s, uh, and, and they did start going to blocks, you know, where here's a block of Petit Syrah, here's a block of Grand Noir, here's a block of Zinfandel. Um, so I'm not sure, uh, you know, if, if some, uh, ag commissioner of the time. Well, know, the, the end of prohibition in there, though, might have figured in somehow. I don't know why, uh, it, it but maybe have, it, it did too. Have, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, so I, I'm, you know, not sure. And that's that's one of the the great mysteries, I think, of these old vine vineyards is why were the varieties planted? You know, that were planted. You know, why why did Alcide have 39 different varieties amongst the Zinfandel? Why only seven years later at the neighboring Papera Ranch, they only planted mostly Carignan? Uh, why over at the Cytone Ranch, just a few hundred yards north of Papera, did they plant so much Alicante, Grand Noir, and Petit Boucher? Uh, are so, these families around at all that you could ask? I mean, are there members of the family? And they may not know, though, because the kid wouldn't know, yeah, that, or exactly. the grandkid, you or know, whatever. The, the Cytones, uh, they're still around and lovely people, but you know, they, they don't know why their grandfather planted what they did. Sure. Um, you know, I talked in, in great depth about why uh, Alcide, you know, with Barbara, his daughter, mm-hmm. why they planted the things they did, and she really didn't know either. Although I did notice at Carlisle Vineyard, there's a lot of swales and wet spots, and in those areas, they tended to plant uh, the Tonturier varieties. And uh, for those of you that don't know, Tonturiers, um, that's a class of hybrid grapes that were developed in the 1800s by the Boucher family. Um, the most uh, common ones that you probably have heard of are Petit Boucher, or not Petit Boucher, but uh, Alicante okay. Boucher, and also uh, Grand Noir. And we find those often in old vine vineyards. Um, but they tended to plant those in the low-line sections. And I think it was because they weren't concerned about quality. They just wanted uh, the contribution of color from Tonturiers. Sure. Tonturier is the French word meaning to tent or to die. Most red grapes, when you squeeze them open, have clear juice when they're perfectly ripe. You squeeze a Tonturier grape open, and it looks like you've literally cut your finger. The juice is blood red. So with old vines in general, I, and, I mean, it's something we've made this assumption that old vines are, um, are better or what you love. I mean, it's funny, in life in general, um, you know, Women and children first. You let the old people die on the Titanic, unfortunately, or things like that. I want. I mean, what is it that you find? Well, I know it's a horrible thing. We're getting older, um, but um, what is it that you that makes them that special compared to, say, a young vine's in? If you, had, I mean, a young vine's in vineyard, what? Are they necessarily inferior, or you know, not not necessarily? And you can certainly make great wine from young vines. There's no question about it. Um, but but it's interesting because I, I mentioned at the start that sometimes we pick the young vines separate from the old mm-hmm. vines within an old vine vineyard, and you'd think, okay, same soil, same microclimate, same farming, or even maybe a little different, but. When you when we end up picking them separate and you analyze the juice, the juice chemistry of the old vines is much better balanced than it is of the young vines. Is that true? Have you ever dealt with um, young vines on a trellis? Or I mean, because a lot of the old vines are are head pruned, head pruned, right? Yeah, and the replants are right. Pruned, yeah. So would youngs in on a trellis? I mean, that's what we've gone to with Pinot, as opposed to I mean, you've got very different things. So. Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I mean, trellising could, uh, could, could uh, influence it, sure. certainly. Sure, sure. Um, so on the, the trellis ends, do you deal with mm, stuff that is trellised much? Or have you ever played with it in your life? I mean, you, I don't know, you, you always had old vines, I guess, was yeah, the main yeah. focus. Well, have you ever well, dealt with In terms of Zenfandel. Yeah. Trellis. Sure, few, but okay. not many. Um, I'd say pretty much, at least in, in our, uh, last year we made 14 different Zinfandels, 
uh, and I believe every single one is from Headquarters okay. Vineyards. Are people planning Zen? Um, in now, new? Uh, yeah, occasionally, yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, Zen acreage is kind of remaining pretty constant. Okay. It, it's not greatly increasing, nor is it greatly decreasing. Okay. Back in the, the early 90s, when Deloach first came mm -hmm. out with a bunch of vineyard-designated Zinfandels, uh, they, they, there were five. There was Paletti Ranch, which is now Carlisle. There's, there was Papera Ranch, which is still Papera. Mm -hmm. um, there was Barbieri Ranch, which, uh, did you ever get fruit? Yeah, we got Barbieri oh, oh, a couple right. of years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and we called it Pietro's. Right. Mm -hmm. um, there was Gamboji, mm -hmm. and then the fifth one was Cytone. Okay. And, and it was a great vineyard. but I never uh, really knew it in the Deloach portfolio yeah, as well yeah, as the others for, for some reason. reason. It yeah. didn't, didn't quite get the uh, attention of, say, Paletti or Papera yeah. or Barbieri, but uh, it's a wonderful old vine vineyard, dry farm planted 1895, mm -hmm. and literally, as, as I mentioned earlier, just a couple hundred yards uh, north of Papera Ranch. Um, Russian River Zen is somewhat different. People are nowadays associating Russian River with Pinot Noir, uh, yeah. but but in Dry Creek was in. I mean, there was kind of this thing, but there's some great. Mm, the, know, these are both it, Russian River, obviously. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, I think Russian River does a tremendous job with Zinfandel. Mm -hmm. um, and and where in fact these vineyards are, Carlisle Vineyard, Papera, Cytone that we were discussing. Um, to me, the, that's kind of ground zero for Old Vine Zinfandel in the Russian River Valley uh, in terms of Old Vine Zin. Uh, there's another patch on Wood Road of Old Vine Zin um, where the Bologna uh, yep. Vineyard is. There is a patch up on Limerick Lane, but uh, the Piner Olivet area, it's, it's where it's at. Cool. I believe we've got a couple of questions. Yes. So what is your biggest challenge these days as a winemaker? Is it... Growing your grapes? Is it bottling? Is it in the process of making your wine? Is it marketing your wine? Oh, man. It seems like there's new challenges every day. Um, you know, certainly uh, uh, holding on to old vine vineyards uh, has been a challenge. Um, we've lost a couple to uh, either replanting to more fashionable varieties. I.e. Pinot Noir. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. It's fine. Mm -hmm. I got it. Um, and, uh, or, or development. Um, and, and so the, that's, that's been tough. Um, but, but there's, you know, compliance, um, you know, that's something that you often don't hear winemakers talk about, but, uh, as a result of Granholm, uh, in 2005 that opened up, you know, direct shipping to other states, uh, there's a lot of compliance that comes with that. a lot of paperwork, a lot, a lot of BS paperwork. and that kind of stuff as well, uh, cause it's government stuff so yeah. you got to do twice as much to get half as much done um you know we probably filed over 600 reports last year just for direct shipping um so uh but beyond that um you know mother nature you know i mean she's been kind to us the last couple of years 12 and 13 couldn't ask for much better 2014 this year yeah, I mean, it's been a dream of a growing season, other than the lack of water, but the vines seem to be doing okay. But, uh, man, you look at 2010 and 2011, I don't even want to go there. I mean, right. yeah, those were tough years. You kind of uh, also, if I can ask another question, because having traveled up in this region for a few days, I hear about the movie that made Pinot Noir mm -hmm. uh, very popular, and so uh, we've kind of removed from that, and wine in and of itself, at least in Southern California where I live, seems to have curried favor. Is there some trend toward other wines that you're seeing that is riding the coattails of Pinot Noir, or are people just, was Pinot Noir sort of ground zero of uh, turning people on to other wines? Um, Pinot Noir, obviously, sideways was 10 years ago this October. Was what it would wow. be. Um, so Pinot took a huge jump after Sideways. But one of the things that's kind of forgotten is you go back before that, is 60 Minutes did a thing about the French paradox and how good wine is for you to drink, that kind of thing. Um, prior to that, white wine outsold red wine in California. That's true. Yeah, it did. And then that changed things dramatically. So we were talking on the way over here, Mike and I, where a lot of these social aspects can change things. Critics while still very important, hit, um, 
if you already subscribe to the Wine Spectator, you subscribe to to Robert Parker's Wine Advocate or Stephen Hanser, you've already heard about Mike's wines generally. So uh, there's a just an incremental growth. I mean, it's still great to get the ratings and reviews and all that, but it's yeah. an incremental growth in customers. Getting your name out there in other ways becomes more and more important. And sometimes it's things that make no sense. Um, Muscat, because Drake... Mentioned it in a hip hop song. I mean, things like that. It's just kind of Moscato. Yeah, Moscato yeah, with yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah. that that that's what happened. But but you know, I, I'm not sure I see any particular variety that has really you know that's going to be the next big thing like Pinot was after Sideways. Um, you know, it seems like wine consumers are are experimenting more than ever now with different varieties and different styles of wines and and you know there's really something out there for everyone it's uh, there's never been more diversity than there is now. and high quality diversity too the quality of wines yeah, is pretty extraordinary yeah, yeah. yeah and i think our good friend russell bevinson in a tape question as well oh. hello mike russell bevin here is one of the few people who's been lucky enough to try your amazing wine since the early 90s I was wondering, qualitatively, you've always remained so high, regardless of the vineyard and vintage, your wines always speak to a purity of fruit and amazing intensity. What's been the biggest change since the early days? Because the wines have always been amazing, but I know all winemakers love to play and make little changes. What, what have you done differently over the last 20 years? <laughs> oh, well, thank you for the question, Russell. Uh, very kind of you. and. Uh... Uh, what have I done differently? Boy, um, you know, it's really, uh, there's been nothing dramatic. It, it's, it's been a series of, of kind of stepwise refinements, I think. Um, you know, I mean, compared to the days of home winemaking in the garage, you know, and you got to taste some of those wines, you know, now we have temperature control. Uh, you know, we, we have glycol for, for, you know, managing our fermentations and, and making sure they don't get too hot. Um, but it's really, you know, when it comes to making the wines, I've just tried to stay true to my palate and make wines that I hopefully want to drink. Is your palate changing over those years, though? A absolutely. Absolutely. I think when our kids were little, um, and I'd come home and they were running around naked and screaming and, and I couldn't hear anything and there were kids in the house I didn't even know. Right. I wanted a big wine. I wanted something that, you know, would overcome all the hubbub. Um, you know, and now as I'm getting older, I find that I can, you know, take great pleasure in, in a more subtle wine, something that doesn't speak so loudly. Sure. And, and I can really... You mentioned that you're just getting old is the problem, but um, you, that's what well, I yeah, 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 But you yeah. mentioned something about, um, in an interview at one point in time, something about like mid-palate or richness or, I mean, there was something that is more a textural thing, I guess. It was in... Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, as, as uh, in winemaking, you know, I used to just kind of focus on the, uh, you know, like, let's get the color, let's get, you know, aroma, flavor and everything. But those things kind of come pretty easily. I mean, at least with the vineyards we're working mm -hmm. with, um, you know, we don't need to worry about getting those things. And so I've kind of turned my attention to texture and, and the mouthfeel and, and wanting that seamlessness uh, that is so elusive, as you probably know, to achieve in a wine. You know, you probably have in your head an idea of the perfect Pinot Noir. Yeah. And in my mind, I have a, an idea of what the perfect Zinfandel would smell like, taste like, how it would feel on the palate. And, and that's what drives me and motivates me. That's what I want to achieve. Will I ever? I, I think it's probably unachievable. I mean, I actually, think so. I think it's one of those things that that's what keeps you going. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. All right. We have a couple more questions. I'm just going to fire them off for you. All right. Uh, Mike, what do you see as the two to three best young vines in vineyards in Sonoma County? And the second question is, how are the old Deloach bottlings from the 90s holding up? Has Adam or Mike had any of these recently, and what did they find in terms of aging quality? Hmm. Uh, best young vine vineyards. Well, I, I, well, 
That's a tough one. I mean, there's a lot of vineyards in Sonoma County, but I, I have great hope for the the new vineyard that we've done in Bennett Valley. That's up on a ridge top on Bennett Ridge, actually near Taylor Mountain. I mean, looking at the at the you know climate up there, um, looking at the soils up there. Um, looking at the rootstock and, and the clone that we've selected, there's great, great promise. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. Um, other vineyards? Uh, well, no, I'll go with one that's not young vine, but the section we get is fairly young vine, but I think Limerick Lane, while they've got the old uh, stuff, yeah, yeah, but, that's, but that's our true, friend the Bilboros yeah, do. That's true. Um, I, I really I mean, like I thinking about that because I do the old the vines. The old vines, there, but, but we don't. But I think that quality of farming and their, their appreciation for old vines is going to that, translate into how they farm. Yeah. No, that's exciting, too. Yeah. Um, geez, man. I, you know, I'm sure there's others, but it's just... Well, I mean, in the, the, the realm that we're talking about, I think there's a lot of stuff that we still haven't done enough of. Grenache, Moved, some blends, some opportunities to do some field blends there. Um, I wish there were more of those being planted, I don't know what the market's like necessarily for them, but yeah, yeah. those could be... Ah, I know something that's exciting. Yeah. Uh, the Steiner Vineyard, uh, Gruner Veltliner. Yeah. You know, I mean, here we, we planted Gruner, or well, I didn't plant it, but, you know, the owner and the vineyard manager established this little two-thirds of an acre block of Gruner Veltliner, the only Gruner in Sonoma County. You know, none of us really knew did what Did they do it because you wanted it? Um, I did want it, yes. Well, yes. I know, but I mean, it's, it's not like Gruner... It's a great grape, but I mean, it may not have come to a grower's mind right off the bat that yeah, we should well, do that. Yeah, well, it was the vineyard manager, who, who okay. Chris Bolin, who, who yep. suggested it. So, um, no, it turned out, uh, you know, when we got the first Gruner off there and made the wine, it was like, oh, my God, this tastes just like Austrian Gruner from, yep. from the Vakau. It was, it was awesome. So, um, so that was the, the first question. The second one was? Uh, old Deloach. Old Deloach. And how they're coming yeah. along. You know, I, I still have some in my cellar. Um, I'm trying to recall the last time I had one. I don't know. I've got to come over to your house, yeah. though. And we'll, yeah. 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 Um, and uh, I think they're holding up pretty well from what I recall. Um, some of the later 90s have Brett, um, mm -hmm. but, but some of the, like, 95 and earlier, uh, you know, they're holding up. That, and that's one thing about those old Deloach vineyards in the Piner Olivet area is that being a very cool microclimate there, the Zinfandel, even at high sugar, really retains a lot of acid. And, in fact, you almost have to pick on acid more than you do on sugar. So that acidity really helps the wine age. Uh, and in fact, one of the problems, problems, one of the challenges, things I've been dealing with, you make a lot more Zen than I do, but has been like with Papera, where we get Zen, we get a little bit from you as well, but Papera with it being almost all Zen, the acid can be like extraordinarily high. I mean, it's, it's, it can it's, be more than a white wine. It can oh, be yeah. like a, a Mosul. Top, re top Sarpinos, top, yeah, I mean, yeah. Sonoma, it's, it's you know, way up there. Yeah, TA is 8 grams per liter yeah. and a pH of 3.3 and you're at 16 alcohol. Yeah, and, and, and that's um, trying to figure out how to make that. And the fact that it's all Zen in that kind of acidity, uh, uh, to me what I love about this wine is it does have some base notes to it. But before that, it can be all very lifted in some ways. With yeah, the acid yeah. and red fruit and zin, um, it's just a challenge. We've had to figure out how to deal with it. In some yeah, ways. no, it's, it, it is a challenge. It is. Um, so where you've got a new building, new winery, new all of that. I mean, I know yeah. it's a hassle, too, in some ways, <laughs> dealing with all that. But And harvest is coming early this year, like you were saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, are you drinking more? Uh, oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, so um, yeah, the the new barrel building is scheduled for completion on August twenty first. Um, we'll probably see fruit a few days after that. Okay. So uh, we're you got to be thrilled that it was cooled down like a, a week or ten well, days yeah, ago. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you, you might have been before then. Even right, if, right, yeah. right. No, so um, you know it's kind of a, a a race between the building and harvest. They're going neck and neck and. I'm just hoping that building finishes first. When, when you answered about compliance and direct shipping and all of that, are you having to deal with compliance issues, I assume, in just building a new building? And, I mean, are there, like, county and, I mean, all sorts of licensing yeah, and things? Yeah, there, there was, uh, you know, I mean, my legs are really strong from all the hoops I've jumped through. Uh, perfect, so, yeah. yeah. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be on the court pretty soon with the Warriors. Uh, 
Well, yeah, maybe <laughs> maybe not. White men can't jump. I understand. So, uh, hey, hey, I got a twelve inch vertical. There you now. go. Is it um, is that exciting though to have the place now? And I mean, there's got to uh, be. No, it, it really is. It really is. Um, it's uh, so nice to be in your own facility. I mean, yeah, I mean, because you yeah. did custom work for a long oh, yeah, what sixteen years? Yeah. two two years at your yeah. place, and then fourteen years somewhere else. Yes, yeah. and. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's nice to be in our own place making wine on our schedule exactly as we want to mm-hmm. make it. And I mean, last year it almost seemed surreal being there. It, it, everything was so peaceful and quiet, and I kept waiting for something bad to happen. But Were there any unexpected difficulties, like challenges or anything? I mean, like trucks up the driveway? Would did it, those worked out okay? No, it was a winery I, before, yeah, it so was, that it helped. Was, so right. was, yeah, no, everything worked worked great, and uh, you know, I mean. The worst thing that happened was uh, in October, the, the chillers started acting up. The glycol chillers started acting up, and uh, we called the service guys. They came out at 9 o'clock at night and, and worked on it for a couple hours and got it fixed. And, you know, but that, that was it. Yeah, that's pretty minor. And, and, and it, it, what was particularly impressive about it all, too, was that we weren't even allowed into the building uh, to move in until – August 1st. Actually, wow. it was July 31st. And when did grapes... And, and it was an early harvest yeah. last year. And yeah. so we basically had four weeks. We had this empty building. We had four weeks to move our tanks, our barrels, get everything set up. We had a new press coming from Germany. We had new crusher to stimmer from Germany, sorting table from Washington State. Everything had to come together in four weeks. There was tons of electrical work that needed to be done, all this 480, 30-amp service installation. And it just, it, you know, August 27th, we plugged everything in, turned it on, it worked. Two days later, the first fruit came. Any thoughts? I mean, it's in a cool area. Any thoughts? I mean, neat area. Eventually, at some point in time, I mean, I know you don't really welcome visitors per se. I mean, you're making wine, you've got a mailing list and all that. You don't unwell. I mean, that sounds awful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, we welcome. Well, they, no, I, but you know what I mean. It's I, not like I a drop-in yeah, tasting yeah, room yeah, kind we, of we place and all of that. We don't right. have a tasting room, all that. Yeah, but I mean, if production ever got to that point, all that, it wouldn't be a bad place for it, I would think. I no, mean, you know, it's it's a beautiful property. Yeah. There's, you know, it's, it's 21 acres or 20 and a half acres studded with oak trees and beautiful views and, and it's a gorgeous spot. Yeah. Uh, 21 acres. Could you plant it? Uh, plant something? At least some of it, yeah. I mean, we don't want to take out oak trees, but, right. uh, you know, if, if we uh, didn't, we could probably plant, uh, call it five to seven acres. Right. So, uh, you got you got it, but I mean, you've got your hands full with a building, and this I'm sure year, they're financial yeah, concerns. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mike and I also share the same bank, so I mean, our <laughs> bank has been very nice to deal with. We can do a shout out to, yeah, to yeah. Silicon so, Valley so Bank. Silicon Valley Bank. Yeah, they yeah. they are a, a heads, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, they, they, they've been great. I mean, you know, it's funny. Uh, a year ago, a good friend of mine uh, announced that, or a year and a half, that he was going to be going into his own place, and. And my wife, Kendall, she said, you know, hon, are you, are you jealous? Do you want your own place? And I said, oh, no, no, no. You know, I'm I'm good. You know, mm-hmm. we'll, we'll custom crush for the rest of our lives. That's fine. And four months later, we were the owners of a winery. Wow. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> go figure. So, uh, it's summertime. Um, you've got kids, one uh, daughter that's home now and all that uh, from college. Uh, just for a week. Right. <laughs> and a son who's in high school but looking at college. Yep, yep. Um, wine business interests on either Rachel or Riley's part? Uh, well, uh, Rachel definitely likes champagne and okay. expensive champagne. Uh, so boyfriend's got to, like, live yeah, up yeah, to it. Yeah. they got a standard. That's mm-hmm. going to be tough. Yeah. Um, on, uh, you know, but, but Riley, you know, he's, he, it's funny. Rachel is kind of big picture. She's a business. In fact, she's majoring in business and marketing mm-hmm. and, and she's going to be great at it. She might be able to do a Facebook or Twitter page or yeah, something yeah. for you guys at some point. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, we don't do Facebook. No. Um, you know, and with Riley, uh, he's kind of more the scientific oriented one and he's asking questions about how do yeast work and what, what about malolactic fermentation? How does that work? And so, you know, truthfully, I sometimes, you know, like to daydream and I think about my daughter handling the business side and I think about my son being the winemaker, mm-hmm. but 
uh, you know. Just, that works so well for the Madavi. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> had to, uh, um. But, you know, truthfully, this was my passion that I pursued. And I encourage both of them. They need to pursue their passion. Sure. And, and if that's not wine, I am totally fine with that. People have asked me, because we got three kids, about the same kind of thing. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, they could maybe not like wine. They could do this, this, or God forbid, maybe they like Cabernet. And they want to do Cab there, instead. There I mean, yeah, so it could yeah. be as simple as that, yeah. that it wouldn't be yeah. old vines in, or it yeah. wouldn't be, I mean, that they could fall in love with a grape type and still want to do the wine business, but their own thing. Yeah, so. that's, that's true. Yeah. That's true. So. We doing okay? I think this is, um, we're... At the end here, but this was fun, Mike. We should oh, do oh, this. Hopefully, this isn't the end. No, well, not the end. Of, no, 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 not the end of. But the end of this segment with you. How's that? Thank you, Mike, Thank for you, everything. Adam. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Thank you all for being here. Uh, for Thank joining you, us. We Thank appreciate you. it. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>